So David, you're a millennial writing about millennials, sort of advising town elders about the issues of your generation. And that begs some background. First, how old are you? I am 24. Okay, and give me your, your background. Where did you go to school? Where did you grow up? And why did you feel compelled to write this? I grew up in Weston, Connecticut, uh, about an hour outside New York City. And as a, as a student in high school, I actually started a film festival for high school students, which in which we saw these great films coming in about uh, young people writing, making films about issues about bullying and uh, teen suicide. This was in 2003, way before these things were part of the national conversation. Uh, and seeing sort of the power of film and the way that it was impacting my generation. And from that, decided to go make a film uh, about the election in 2008 and went around the country interviewing members of Congress about why they thought more young people weren't voting and trying to get my peers to vote, which led into starting an organization called Generation 18, which took the film around the country and registered 25,000 new voters in 2008. And then we did a similar film in, t in 2012. Uh, and I, while doing all that, I went to, uh, went to NYU, where I graduated. And I understand we both were part of the same program there? Yes, we both went to Gallatin, which is a great program. And uh, I, highly re I highly recommend it. Well, and it allows you to sort of craft your own curriculum. And you can cross disciplines. That's sort of the point of Gallatin. So what did you do? So I, my concentration was the intersection of film, technology, and politics with an emphasis on youth and social change. It sounds like. So your dedication page reads in part, to my mother and father, the greatest boomers I know. Let's talk about their generation for a minute because um, they, they get some flack for some mistakes that they may have made. What's your overall read on baby boomers? I think that the boomer generation was an incredibly and is an incredibly important generation in our nation's history. You know, much of what is going on today in America would not have been possible without them. The civil rights movement, which they played a leading role in pushing that forward and ending the war in Vietnam and changing the way we viewed citizen involvement in government, uh, changing the way we think about our, our, our elected officials and the ability to create you know, upstart movements. I think all that was incredibly important, the beginning of the women's movement, mm -hmm. uh, all, that, all that great activism that they produced. And that, all of that is, we're seeing that directly play out today, you know, whether it's the election of Barack Obama or the you know, continued advancement of women in Congress. Mm -hmm. uh, so all that is a direct result of their activism. That being said, uh, there's a lot of work left undone. And I think that there's, you know, we, we now spend three fourths of our, you know, entitlement money on people who are o over the age of 30. It right. used to be that we spend three fourths on people under right. the age of 30 in terms right. of the amount of money and investment. It's not a question of generational warfare, yeah. but I think that we need to have a conversation right. about how we're dividing our, our priorities. This is not a generation that expects to get. Those that and those entitlements. By the way, this right. is not a generation with any any belief that the government is going to give them that money in, in the long term. <laughs> yeah, I would think so. Well, the the, the activism you talked about, uh, you know, from from the baby boomer generation, is that an activism that has trickled down to millennials, or do you see them as more politically apathetic? Or well, I think the activism of that generation was very much instilled in the millennials, the children of the boomers, as we were growing up. Uh, this was a generation of people who you know, read us the news and, and, and taught this idea of, of values and the way that you should be involved in civic engagement and responsibility and, and brought a lot of that spirit into this generation. But I think the way that we look at activism is totally different. The boomer generation believed in activism in the streets, you know, marching, protesting, and our generation believes you can be an activist by creating a business that, that, does, that changes the way the world is thinking about energy, for instance. There are a lot of young people who are starting green energy and alternative energy companies. Uh, we believe that you can do it through technology. All these ways that are very powerful, they're just not seen. They're, they're, they're rather, they're, they're, they're not seen by everyone else. So I think that that's part of the challenge that we face is people say we're apathetic and we're lazy because the activism is not as in your face and it's not out there. I, I'm sure that's true, but there's also this conceit that the activism is lazy because it's so easy. You can go online and sign an online petition or you can tweet something and that counts as activism today. Is that a fair 
uh, critique? I think that idea has actually been pretty overplayed, that somehow people in this generation feel they press a button and they tweet and they have changed the world. I don't know anyone who has felt that way. What is happening now is there's greater awareness and accessibility towards political involvement and involvement in social activity. And that's a good thing, that you know there are more people who are having some level of access to that process than not. And the hope is that for some of those people in the long term, that will develop into more, and that will develop into greater engagement. Everything we know about the, how people develop says that if you introduce a habit or you introduce an idea to someone when they're young and impressionable in their formative years, that later on, that's something that's going to become part of their life. So the idea that people are texting $5, that's great. We have more young people who are being you know, donors than ever before. And hopefully that means in the future, people will believe that it's a good thing to give money and to make donations as they get older. So I think that there's, it's not that we're losing the people who, the activists who are doing the hard work, but we're also gaining mm. people with at least a surface level engagement that can grow over time. Well, and we'll return to politics in a bit. But first, describe to me a millennial. What are the values of that generation? What are their goals? What's their identity? Challenges, their assets, what do they bring to the table? Just paint a picture for me. So this is a generation that came of age in a, a period that, that I call the fast future, thus the title of the book, which means that in the past 10 years, as this generation has been growing up, our world has gone through an accelerated pace of change. The amount of change that takes place today in one year is equal to the amount of change that took place in some entire centuries. Mm -hmm. And once in a generation, we have this kind of revolution that shifts the fundamentals of our economy. You look at the Industrial Revolution. You look at the introduction of the automobile. All these you know, changes in our society are powered by exponential technology, which changes the pace of everything from how we communicate and how fast we expect people to respond to things to our political system and the pace of how quickly things happen and being on constant in a constant feedback loop right. to the ability to trade stocks in nanoseconds. Mm -hmm. uh, so millennials are at the forefront of that. We understand that as reality. So while other generations are running around saying, how do we adapt? How do we move? How do we you know, get, go forward in this sort of fast-paced world? The millennials are taking it all in stride because that's the reality of how we grew up. And it's also brought us a sense of ease and adaptability. It's brought us the ability to be resilient to you know, the economic crisis, which, wow, has led to incredible youth unemployment and incredible debt for young people, young people are optimistic about their long-term economic future because they see that in one year it could be totally different because mm -hmm. we saw how quickly it started and we could see how quickly it might go away. So there's a sense of that, that the, other, the, other, the grass is greener somewhere on the other side and we have an ability to know that we'll get there. So I think there's a sense of optimism, there's a sense of social mindedness, which I think came out of 9-11, which was a very formative experience in a lot of the minds of this generation, seeing our country in that particular moment and feeling this sort of civic spirit, which I think was really ingrained in this generation at that moment. We've seen a surge in applications to Teach for America and the Peace Corps and the military. And we're seeing a world of the past 10 years which has been focused on all the terrible things going on. If you think about the tenor of the national, international conversation over the past 10 years, it's been about, oh my God, you know, our world is, is in trouble. We have these terrible things going on all over the place. And millennials have seen that and want to do something about it. And we also have the ability to do something about it because we have the ability to scale action mm -hmm. in a way that previous generations haven't. And how, how is growing up in the midst of what's essentially been a 10-year war, war on terror, how has that shaped the millennial viewpoint? It's made this generation realize that we're part of an interdependent global world. This is really the first global generation who's cognizant of the rest of, of the world being deeply related to us. It, it, you may have been able to, in, in some ways, live under a rock in previous generations and be disconnected from the rest of the world and think about uh, you know, America only or your country only. But I think we recognize that. And I think fighting two wars has made this generation, you know, first of all, it's important to remember that this generation is the ones fighting these wars. It's, right. it's overwhelmingly people in this generation who had this experience of fighting these two wars. And it's made this generation perhaps weary of the 
ability, the importance of you know going into going into.